Good day to everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled The Evolving Landscape Around Identity Management, presented by Healthcare Innovation. My name is Mark Hagland. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Healthcare Innovation. Today's program is sponsored by Improvada. Thank you so much to our sponsors at Improvada and to you in our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, I just want to share a few housekeeping details for you. Submit a question, please use the Q&A box to the left of your video window at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program. For technical issues, please press F5 to refresh. And if that doesn't work, you can submit a question with your issue to the Q&A panel. Finally, join our webinar conversation on Twitter. You can tweet using the hashtag, hashtag HILiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our three speakers, um, and I should explain, we are going to have a panel discussion uh, in the form of a round table, um, and it'll be fairly free flowing. So I look forward to this. Uh, I think what I'm just going to do uh, is do this the most informal way possible. I'm gonna ask Mike, Marilyn, and Wes in turn each to introduce themselves, uh, name, title, role, and organization, and connection to this topic. So welcome, panelists. Mike, would you like to go ahead first? Sure, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Booth. I'm one of the information security managers here at UK Healthcare. Been here for about 10 years. I'm responsible for business continuity and disaster recovery and also identity and access management. Uh, we're about a 945-bed academic medical center that serves the Commonwealth of Kentucky, one of two level one trauma centers in the state. And uh, we're here uh, talking, uh, we're deep, deep in the implementation of an EPIC project targeting a June, June go live. And then we're gonna go live with our auto provisioning at that time. Wonderful. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mike. Marilyn, would you like to go next? Sure, I'm Marilyn Cohn. Um, I am an identity and access management uh, programmer. I work for Mike and uh, I've worked at uh, UK Healthcare about 15 years in different roles. And for the past six years, I've worked with identity and access management team um, to help automate provisioning. Um, we previously used uh, a Microsoft product to do that. And we have uh, been in a, about a five, six month project with Improvada um, in implementing the IDG product. Wonderful. And Wes, welcome. Well, thank you for having us uh, here today, Mark. Uh, Mike and Marilyn, thanks for thanks for joining in. I really appreciate that. It's always good when our customers can talk to real live uh, users of the product. So I appreciate you all joining in on this, this chat. Uh, my name is Wes Wright. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Improvada. Uh, come April, which is actually not that many days away now, uh, I will have been at Improvada for uh, three years. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, about 25-ish uh, years in the, uh, other, on the other side of the fence in health delivery organizations uh, and various uh, CIO and CTO and when I couldn't avoid it, uh, CISO uh, roles uh, in those organizations. I'm, I'm really trying to bring, and Gus uh, Melezes, our CEO, brought me on board to bring really the the day-to-day -day IT operations uh, customer aspect uh, to our products and products lines and and show the, the integrations that are possible uh, when we start thinking about digital identity as a, as a maybe, maybe for lack of a better term, as a service uh, rather than point solutions. So uh, I enjoy doing that, uh, giving some, some strategies, trying to look over the, over the horizon on a couple of things and, and uh, and then in the meantime, I, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of great customers uh, like Mike and Marilyn uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and see see what they're doing, how they're doing with the digital identity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, sure. In a moment, we're, thank you. We're going to plunge into the discussion, but Mike and Marilyn, would you just spend a couple few minutes talking about the identity management landscape at UK Health and kind of where you've been and where you're at. Whoever would like to begin, I know you'll both have some thoughts, but just kind of do a level set of your or 
organization's landscape first, and then we'll we'll plunge in and, and discuss uh, what's going on in the world. Do you want to take that from a high level, Mike, or do you want I can go? Just go ahead and dive in. All right. Um, Right, so um, at UK Healthcare, we know we're a teaching um, institution and uh, we uh, are pretty tightly coupled with um, campus for identity management. Uh, they control a lot, uh, real, really the HR system there uh, for our employees and the um, student module within uh, um, SAP uh, for our student identities. And um, our team, um, so we work closely with them. Uh, they kind of, like I said, own the identity piece of this and um, they control actually creating accounts within Active Directory. Um, and then my team really handles managing access within our clinical applications, um, which currently is, is quite a bundle of applications. Um, the the uh, one of the big, um, bonuses for our team going to Epic is uh, we will reduce, I think we're getting rid of like 20, 20 applications we provision for currently um, um, into one single application. So that's a big bonus for us. Um, but but being a teach, teaching institution um, has its challenges with our population, uh, of course, just our, our standard employees. Um, but the student flow is, is very uh, hard to manage on a you know, not, not, not so much on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have um, large student population turnovers every semester um, that the nursing students will get access and then it'll be taken away as soon as their class is done. Um, and that that's quite a challenge um, from, a, from an access management standpoint. And then uh, we also, um, UK is really um, branching out with partnerships uh, and we're bringing on board um, partnerships with other clinics, and so getting them access into our system, somewhat uh, restricted access that maybe our, our standard employees don't have, but ability to, you know, partner with them. And um, we also have our referring physicians. So they aren't employees. They, they never step foot on UK's campus, but they do have, we do have a physician portal. So we uh, provision access for them as well. Um, which also introduces challenges since they're not familiar with UK, um, uh, policies and procedures for, for requ requesting access. So we have um, a very broad range of, of people we provision for, and um, that has made, um, you know, has brought challenges, I think, to our to our provisioning process. And it's, it's constantly, you know, healthcare is constantly changing and the partnerships are growing and um, it, it just brings new opportunities. Yeah, I definitely want to plunge into the provisioning discussion in just one moment. But Mike, would you like to add to anything that Marilyn's just said at the introductory level? Yeah, I think she made it sound a whole lot simpler than it actually is. Uh, <laughs> it's a very, very complicated process, um, partly because, uh, uh, you know, traditionally, I think, as, as it has evolved over the years, uh, the number of applications have grown significantly. Uh, some easily integrate into provisioning systems, some don't. Um, our our team grew out of just uh, being uh, just sitting back and working tickets, and so we're trying to uh, raise that bar, raise the level of automation, the level of um, so that we can move away from just, just cranking out tickets to more of a governance. So the you know, the two areas we're trying to evolve into with uh, with this is identity governance, uh, which is sort of a role based access control, privilege access management. Um, Active Directory account management, things like that. And also um, what a lot of people don't realize is um, this uh, IM team is sort of our front lines of our cybersecurity functions. So they control a lot of um, access the, uh, and um, for our, for our um, employees and customers and clients. So we want to make sure that we put the proper cybersecurity controls in front so that we can be a, a force in uh, helping this, our other brethren on the other side of the cybersecurity wall to uh, to uh, protect the um, protect the assets of the organization. That makes total sense. Thank you so much, uh, Marilyn. Let's just dig a little bit deeper. Let's talk about the uniquenesses of your provisioning environment. Uh, you already referenced this, but um, I haven't really spent a lot of 
mind space thinking about this, but when you consider how complex it is, you've got students, as you mentioned, they rotate in and out all the time. So you've got thousands of users who are um, here today, gone tomorrow. You've got non-employed physicians, so that's a complexity. Um, how do you uh, architect um, how you manage the information that data and information that helps you to uh, determine access, application access. What does that look like? You have multiple system feeds, um, and tell tell us about. Give us a level set of what happened before you decided to implement identity governance. Well. Um... Before IDG, we were we were using a, a Microsoft product, um, but it really um, we were kind of limited in our feeds uh, of data. So we have our our SAP system, which um, houses our employees. Um, we were only connected to that for our employees, so we were missing a lot of the student data. Um, we were missing a lot of data, capturing data about external people. We would we would use the campus system to create an account for them, but they, the, the data collection around that was really missing. Um, it didn't live in a system that we could access. Um, so with Improvada, you know, we've been able, and with some um, just overall business uh, process change, we've been able to um, integrate into a campus system that kind of gives us a, a view of all of those people. Um, so we're pulling that into IDG. Um, we have, um, you know, for our providers, we have a campus, I mean, a, a credentialing system, Cactus, uh, and that really stores um, truly just provider information. So um, it's a, it was always a challenge um, when we'd ask for, you know, just give us a, a data feed of that um, because they never stored account information. They didn't store the employee number. It truly was just provider license and you had to kind of reconcile that again. So, so with some business rules and working with IDG, we were able to kind of join that data and make it make sense. Um, we also have um, an MDM team. Uh, Master UK is really invested in um, uh, master data management and um, really um, we've worked very closely with them. It's been a, a multi-team project um, with Epic going live and uh, They've, they've helped um, kind of combine um, our cactus feed, our residents live in a system called MedHub, um, and they're pulling together all that information to kind of eliminate duplicates, but then, you know, passing that information off to, to IDG so we can make um, some intelligent decisions about, about our provisioning needs. Um, we also have Kronos that we're pulling in. Um, our nurses, our pharmacists live there. That is... Um, also a challenge because a lot of that is hand entered data by uh, people, managers and people on the floor. Um, so, you know, the MDM team has been helpful in, um, you know, uh, uh, transforming that data into something usable for us um, to use to use with Impro Improvada. Um, we, we, UK was uh, already an Improvada customer. We use the one sign application. So, um, you know, the focus of our project right now has been um, integrating with Epic, but, um, you know, we know we can expand. And right now people are manually like enrolling their own badges to do, you know, tap and go kind of logins. And um, we look to really push IDG into, you know, auto enrolling their badge for them. And so, um, you know, Improvada has given us, um, it's a tool that's really kind of expanded our horizons with what we can do with access management. And we can really, um, we have a lot of departments that um, provision to small departmental applications on their own. Uh, we really want to get to centralized provi provisioning. And with this tool, I think we're, we can get there where we can set up approval workflows and things like that. So we have a number of uh, of data sources, but we also have just a lot of systems out there um, that we hope to integrate in, and really tighten down the security around um, some of these applications that we aren't even currently provisioning for. Um, and, and like Mike kind of alluded to, one of the um, um, struggles, I think, with some healthcare applications is they don't have APIs, especially some of our legacy applications. There really is no way to 
to automate provisioning. They don't have an API. They won't let us talk to their database. And there's very good reasons why they've, you know, not done that. But um, we, you basically just have, you know, user interface screens that someone has to type into. Um, and that's also offered a challenge for us um, for automated provisioning. But um, IDG has a really um, nice solution for handling that. And, uh, um, you know, we, we hope to, as soon as we go live with Epic, hope to integrate all of these other applications um, that have been really hard to manage and automate. So. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And, and you've helped me segue perfectly into asking Mike about implementing a new EHR and identity management at the same time. So um, you're either courageous pioneers or gluttons for punishment, <laughs> or may, maybe well, both. Nobody told us when we into this, and nobody had ever really done this before. And we, we couldn't find anybody. So had we known that, we, I don't know if our decision would have been different. Uh, but, you know, we had, you know, it was a combination of, of uh, first of all, Epic is really, really big, and Epic is really, really structured in their projects. So I have to hand it to them on their product with met project methodology. But we really internally had to bring together, as Marilyn said, the MDM team had to create a brand new um, source feed for us out of this that did, did not exist five months, six months ago. Uh, we brought in uh, uh, Infravada with their IDG product, um, and then we had to work with the Epic team, Epic project team, uh, to bring all these forces together. Um, but it's but it's been, I guess, uh, the work, everybody working together, and I can't I can't. Um, Get over. I can't explain enough how well Improvada's uh, their 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 project team and their uh, technical resources worked with us, because a lot of times we work we were working ahead of Epic in the project because Epic uh, really wasn't used mm -hmm. to using automated provisioning on Go Live. A lot of their provisioning tasks were later on in the project, much later than we needed. So we were able to utilize Improvada's um, sort of their expertise in implementing their product before in other areas to uh, sort of let us know what to expect. They help program some things that were really not ready yet for, it, for Epic to give us information on. So once Epic came around and we sort of bumped them and got them to give some stuff early, uh, we were able to basically hit our, our go live here. Actually, we uh, went live with IDG. We loaded all the um, users in there uh, last week, finished loading last week. So it's been a very, very, um, very, very good process so far. Great, great. Um, Wes, let me just ask you what your observations are when you look nationwide at organizations that are attempting these processes either at the same time or one closely after the other. What are the challenges and opportunities there? Wes? Hmm. I thought you were, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry, Mike. Or work. Mark, I thought you were. Uh, yep. You know, uh, at the beginning of the questioning session here, you said you hadn't spent a, a lot of mind space on this. Well, of course, it, it provided being the digital identity company. We have. Uh, and, and and what uh, Mike and Marilyn are talking about around their experience, except for the uniqueness of going live, as you mentioned, live with uh, Epic and, and uh, identity uh, governance system. Uh, and provide IDG at the same time. The, you know, healthcare's uh, the the issues that that uh, uh, Marilyn went over. Those are those are fairly common issues throughout healthcare. It's not it's not a UK specific uh, kind of thing, and that's that's what makes me proud about our Improvide Identity Governance product. Is you know we we do this for healthcare. That's all we do. Uh, our identity governance product is only for healthcare. Uh, just so. Happens fortunately uh, for Mike and Marilyn. Uh, one of our best relationships that we have out there is with Epic. Uh, we can we can do some stuff with Epic. Uh, one uh, better than anybody else can, but but two uh, better than we can with a lot of uh, our different vendors as well. So those two things coming together for for Mike and Marilyn, I think, really helped them out. So yes, what. What's it look like uh, across the, the the national landscape and even international to some degree, <laughs> in a different UK, uh, in, NHS Bolton, uh, in in the UK uh, that is, has has uh, actually stood up in our identity governance product too. But 
when I look at, and talk with my peers uh, 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 out there around identity governance, um, there's a there's a queen, and I commend uh, UK on this, but there's a there's a growing appreciation about how important identity governance is. Uh, it used to be something that guilty as charged that we would push down the down the pike. We would kick that can down the road almost all the time because uh, it's it's really kind of like plumbing. Uh, you know, it's something you need, but uh, you can't see it. Uh, you expect it to be there. Uh, and nobody really gets excited about plumbing. Uh, so it was it was really kind of hard to find champions uh, uh, out there for identity governance. And that is that is changing a lot. And I think something Mike said about uh, uh, identity, uh, their identity governance product uh, being the 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 uh, first piece in their security suite and, and that the, the CISOs have have grasped that. Uh, is it, really important. Uh, you know, NIST just held a conference that's around the solar winds hack that, that occurred, and a, and a CISA analyst, uh, Jay Gasley, uh, uh, I got a quote on one of my slides that he said uh, about this attack, and he's talking about solar winds. Uh, we come to find out that identity is everything. Yeah. What that means is if if you don't know. One, if you don't, you can't verify who's on the network, uh, you know, that these IDs are actually who I think they are. Uh, you, you've got to have that. Two, are they doing what you think they're going to be doing? Uh, you, you know, and, and that's what identity governance helps you do. You know, these are the entitlements. This is what this role, this digital identity is supposed to be doing. And when you see yeah. it do something uh, if you see it do something outside of what identity governance says it should be doing, well, you know, you, you know, you've got a problem. So right. we've, we've really, really across the nation start have started to see uh, identity governance uh, <laughs> to, to take the analogy all the way to its end. Uh, we've seen the plumbing come out from behind the walls and, and the, the chief information security officers, the compliance officers, the risks officers are all uh getting behind the idea of we have to have better identity governance uh, within our facility because otherwise uh, we're risking it all. Yeah. You know, I think I'm glad you mentioned solar winds, uh, Wes, and uh, in, in a few minutes, let's, let's plunge in a little bit more explicitly and specifically about it. But I think in healthcare, especially People only pay attention when a disaster occurs, unfortunately. It's, you know, the, the industry has been very reactive in many ways. And uh, it was a terrible thing that happened, but it also woke people up. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, let me, let me, I want to get back to that in just a few minutes, but let me ask Mike and Marilyn about two things. One is, how has COVID impacted you? Um, if in any way. And then the other is, and kind of related, is what kind of ROI you're looking at uh, in terms of your implementation of identity management and governance. So whoever of the two of you would like to start, uh, again, by addressing the COVID situation and also the, um, the search for ROI, which is uh, endless. You want to take yeah, a comment yeah, I'll, I'll start with the COVID from an operational perspective. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think like everybody uh, and anyone in the healthcare industry, you know, we had our ambulatory clinics um, um, sh shut down and we um, uh, elective surgeries were canceled and we had this workforce that UK Healthcare was desperately trying to, um, 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 what's the word, uh, reallocate basically the resources um, internally to the to the hospital, as well as we were building a, a facility because we didn't know how, how bad COVID was going to be. And that was a huge provisioning undertaking to, to just suddenly recalculate everybody's roles. And, um, you know, when we really didn't have a strong product to to do that at the time, and it was just a lot of manual work, all hands on deck, you know, I, I'm I'm more of a technical programmer and kind of manage the systems, but I was in there, you know, manually provisioning people and changing roles and getting them the access they needed to do their new function 
which wasn't even truly, you know, updated in SAP or any other system. And so um, it was it was definitely an operational quick shift for all of us and uh, was a little crazy at the time. And then just even through, um, you know, as things kind of settled down and it, it got a little bit more stable, um, you know, things like the vaccine coming out, suddenly um, we had to engage a true, like, kind of makeshift workforce. And we had students coming on to help administer vaccines for the for the city of Lexington, really. Um, we, they opened up the stadium. And and um, so getting those people access um, to our systems to record that, you know, people have given vaccines, you know, is just, um, just kind of overwhelming, honestly. Um, and nothing I've ever been through since I've worked, even at UK, you know, I, I've just, I've worked in identity access management in, the past six years, but um, just the whole uh, scale of the shift of the business and and people just uh, taking over new roles was was pretty incredible. Um, we didn't have IDG implemented at the time, but um, you know, having worked with it now, um, it really you know could have helped with it, just saving us time um, and really tracking. Um, who was who was changing and, and what roles they were going to, um, you know that that was kind of all lost, honestly, in, in the mad dash to get people the new access they needed. And then, of course, the switch back as things started opening up. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, definitely, a product like IDG would have been really beneficial um, had we had it up at that time. Right. What what Marilyn and Mike, both of you, what have you learned? What have the biggest lessons been that you've learned so far? because of everything that you've had to work through in COVID? For me, really, I think an, uh, a more efficient audit tra <laughs> trail of, of the changes that are going on. I mean, that's really, um, the, the tool we used before was great for um, provisioning. And really, when, we, when I talk about that tool and auto provisioning, really what it did was take away the manual entry of a lot of the data. So it wasn't doing a lot of business intelligence. Um, it wasn't doing any kind of auditing. Um, it would in, enforce, you know, the role you might select within the tool, but someone was manually kind of selecting that. And we're really, with IDD, we're really trying to get to more of an intelligent design and an auditing system to really track, um, you know, when changes are made and why they're being made. and. Um, um, I think that was kind of key for me out of COVID because it was just so, um, just such an intense time. There's just so much change going on. And we went, UK had not really um, delved, delved into telehealth and, with, you know, all the physicians got sent home and telehealth was now a thing. And, yeah. you know, that was different, um, making sure the physicians could do their job remotely. You know, that parts of that fell on access management. Um um, so it, it um, yeah, just a lot of the audit and, and, and really just being able to, the need to be able to shift that quickly um, was really kind of driven home during this event. Um, yeah. We just haven't had, usually we're, we, you know, usually if something like this happens, we get kind of a, maybe at least a week warning <laughs> or something that major is coming. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this was just really unexpected and unprecedented for us. I know a year, a year ago, the healthcare system had to do, it was like being in the army, right? <laughs> or National yeah. Guard, and you're swallowed up in one day. Uh, I know numerous CIOs and other leaders who said that uh, they literally went to from like 1% telehealth visits to 80% in three days or a week. So, yeah, it would definitely affect you guys. Uh, Mike, do you have anything? To add in terms of lessons learned uh, on the COVID experience so far, I think it, I think it brings out and what Marilyn sort of pointed to is the automation and the you know we're looking at reengineering our totally identity access management function from the ground up uh, to add um, to add some reengineering the processes, the automating processes uh, because uh, there's just so much involved now, so many applications. You know we have over twenty thousand users, employees, providers. And with the small team that we've got, it's impossible to just uh, run run that process through tickets, right? So you have to have you be able to you need to be able to automate 
to uh, be able to have, you know, do more with, uh, with the, the same people. And we're getting to the point now that uh, from the auditing standpoint um, and just the pure management of everything from uh, our side of the Active Directory to all the application access, uh, you just need to have a very efficient automated way of handling that. And that's sort of where we're, we're building it out right now. Uh, and, I, and the IDG is sort of our cornerstone or foundation for starting that. That's good. That's great. Um, ROI is such a slippery concept when it comes to anything security related. Uh, Mike, do you have any thoughts on how, and certainly Marilyn, if you'd like to add any thoughts on how you how you frame the concept of ROI in this situation, in this context? Well, you know, let's be blunt. We purchased IDG, and we, we sort well, so we used Epic to uh, as our as our starting point, launching point for our identity governance, and and we purchased IDG specifically because of its integration into Epic. Um, so we, an ROI, our ROI, ROI in this case is really not financial at this point. It's more of, uh, it's focused on operational capability and efficiency. And, uh, once we get that rebuilt or re-engineered, then we're going to go back and, uh, you know, look at some of the ways we can, uh, you know, calculate an ROI. But, um, this is just more of a, a launching us into a, sort of the next level of, uh, of functionality and efficiency. So, the traditional ROI from a financial standpoint really wasn't a driver in this. It's more of a strategic um, direction change. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Uh, Marilyn, anything you'd like to add? Or uh, then I have another topic for you. No, I, I like what Wes said. You know, for me, like if, if we're doing identity and access management correct they shouldn't even know there's a team doing it right <laughs> like it should just be done and 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 uh, you know when they when they know the name of the IAM team to me that's like that's not <laughs> that's not a good thing so um uh, for me uh, and the, the tool itself um you know we we used to have a very large number of people doing um manual provisioning and when we went um to the Microsoft product we cut back on the team um, um, but that product was really the, the reason they, you know, brought me over was I had been a developer and it, it required, you know, a C sharp developer to do some of the integrations we did. Um, the, the really nice thing about Improvata is, you know, our whole team are now, you know, Improvata IDG admin certified. Um, it's a tool that you don't have to necessarily be a developer to be effective in, um, you know, certainly being a developer has helped on the back end and understanding um, a lot of the integrations, but it's really empowered, I think, the members of our team um, to be um, more than just data entry people. And, um, and, and, they, and they are, you know, but that's, that's a lot of times how they felt just because they didn't have the tools to kind of empower them to, to do their job more effectively. So um, kind of an intangible ROI. <laughs> Okay, that makes that makes so much sense. Um, how Mike and Marilyn, and then I'm going to ask Wes to give us a national uh, kind of perspective this, on this. But how have your uh, priorities changed since the onset of the pandemic with respect to IT governance, including how you think about how you provision users? Well, provisioning, you know, when we went, uh, we went, uh, I guess last year, we sort of have to take the entire workforce and now they're, you know, basically remote. We had to do a lot of stuff to give them access to remote. Um, and one of the things that's just, uh, uh, that's becoming very, very clear is uh, the, the, the identity part is, uh, is more important than ever, right? So we have to prove um, that who they are, they have to prove their identity and then we have to access it, and we have to make sure that we access with uh, uh, with the security that somebody has authorized access. So, uh, COVID, I think, has really brought home to us uh, the the need to have um, tight uh, controls over what we do, and be able to log what we do, and protect uh, uh, the asset internally. Uh, from an operational standpoint, Maryland could probably handle that. Right. I mean, I think even, you know, the business is looking at, um, um, 
we, we already have this provider MDM, but really kind of this people MDM where we're really managing more information just outside of their SAP. The SAP data is good at kind of giving you an indication of why they were hired, but they, they may not be doing that exact job. It really doesn't have the role information. So I think, I think COVID and then even the, the, the Epic implementation is kind of brought out um, that we need better data to help describe our people um, and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I, I, I think it's just really kind of brought to light, you know, I've worked in this six years and it's, it, and at times it's like people kind of underestimate how, how provisioning should work. And um, I, I kind of feel like between COVID and Epic, you know, people that weren't kind of getting the the gravity of it and, and the complexity of it are, are kind of finally seeing it. And, um, um, yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, what, what are you saying on a nationwide basis in terms of how uh, professionals like Marilyn and Mike frame the issues right now? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say post pandemic, but post, emergence of pandemic since we're still in it, um, how priorities are changing and how they frame the concept of provisioning now, which inevitably is is shifting a bit. What what, what are you seeing nationwide? Yeah. Uh, you know, nationwide, I, <laughs> I wrote a, a white paper for Improvata uh, probably six, eight months ago. It was, the title was uh, of it was, dang, I wish I would have had an identity governance system. Uh, and it was all it was all about uh, how how coming through COVID or what we saw in COVID, Maryland described it exactly. You know, we initially thought that we were going to see a big surge of new providers into a healthcare organization, and in a couple places, say New York and California, you did see some of a surge. But what we really saw, and Maryland references was this change in roles, you know, that, that ambulatory nurse who used to stay at Clinic B, and that, that's where he lived his entire time. Well, they needed some extra nursing staff in the COVID to, to, to go do, you know, to, to do that type of nursing. So that ambulatory, ambulatory person who had these entitlements uh, uh, because of that job, then went over into the COVID ward and got this whole other set of entitlements because they went into the COVID ward and needed to get these applications and these these uh, uh, machines. Uh, and, and then, okay, now now we're kind of down, down surging, and that ambulatory sur that ambulatory nurse goes back to Clinic B, and we don't know what happened with him. We don't know. We don't know. Oh. Uh, yeah, he got those. He got those extra entitlements, but we don't. We didn't have a system in place to show that. So now what we've got is something I called stack shares or stacked entitlements. So when that regulatory nurse moves to Clinic B and goes over to maybe a, an out an outpatient surgery ward. Well, he's going to move over there with entitlements for ambulatory from Clinic B, uh, the COVID ward, which inevitably had access to ED data and, and, and ICU data, and then go over to the surgery uh, clinic and on top of that, get stacked entitlements on top of that. To, that pretty soon, this nurse that stays around in the health system for 30 or 40 years will essentially have access to every application and every share within the department. And so when that nurse uh, uh, clicks on the wrong thing and gets ransomware, well, he's got he's got uh, access to everything in your network. So that ran that ransomware spreads everywhere. And that's that's what we saw. Uh, coming out of this pandemic, you know, once the once the uh, healthcare heroes were able to lift their heads up, you know, away from provisioning people to work from home and building tents for uh, triage and that kind of thing, once they were able to, they all said what Marilyn has said, and that is, we did it, but right now I can't unwind it because I don't, don't, I don't have a, I didn't have a tracking system in place to show what I did. I didn't have an auditing system in place that said, yeah, I got this, this role, this, this role. Mm -hmm. So you couple that with the increasing uh, importance, uh, you know, identity is everything, according to the cybersecurity infrastructure. Uh, you, 
couple those two things together and like Marilyn or Michael talk to their, their security counterpart and the security person will go, hey, this identity stuff's really important. Can you tell me who has access to what? And before IDG, they'd have to go, uh, I could tell you what they had before, before the pandemic, pretty much, but now everything just kind of went everywhere. So you couple those two things together and you're really starting to see uh, um, not just an operating IT, not just the CIO, but the CISO, the CFO, the COO, and uh, to some degree, the CEO, uh, all going, oh, wait a minute. Turns out this identity thing, which used to be, I just need you to have access to this so you can do their job. It turns out that that's really important in actually protecting my entire network, all the resources on my network, so now I'm going to elevate that, and you have that C-suite uh, championing, for lack of a better term, uh, of uh, your identity governance, your identity management programs, which is obviously uh, what's happening at, at University of Kentucky Health System. Right. Absolutely, Wes. And I'll add to all those O's, I'll add two more O's, the CMO and CNO, because uh, they are now realizing that this can have very serious consequences uh, and they need to make sure that their clinicians are protected, that the network is protected, that everyone and everything is protected. And so it gets their attention. Uh, the, the case study that you mentioned of the nurse who moves around to all these different places, suddenly it's like, wow, this is really not a great situation. Um, yeah, great call out, Mark. Know, I, great call out. Thank you. Marilyn, I think you were about to say something, but Oh, no. Buzz. <laughs> oh, you were just nodding intelligently. I was. So. I was just nodding <laughs> agreement. <laughs> That's great. Well, listen, we have several questions from the audience, and I want to give us time to answer the questions, and then we'll come back, and I'm going to ask each of you to leave us with uh, a piece of advice and or a prediction. But let, let me go to uh, – we've got several questions here. So, um, Okay. So one uh, audience member says, curious about the source of student slash employee ID data being used to identify authorized access to applications. Is this originally from HR slash SAP slash CACTUS or other source like active directory question? Are you doing two-factor authentication? We do, we do have um, two-factor authentication um, enabled um, with our campus partner. Uh, we, uh, there's certain applications, but certainly to get into the network from home, um, two factors on, and then other various applications um, are integrated with it, uh, with two-factor um, through the enterprise. And we will be looking to do that, I, I think, probably long-term with <laughs> every other application where it makes sense. Um, and I forgot the I forgot the first part of the question. That's mm -hmm. Oh, uh, the audience member wanted to know um, whether oh uh, what the source of student or employee ID right. data was being used to identify authorized access to apps. Right. So so right now, um, um, SAP uh, data is. Um, is used to identify kind of um, their base role, but we also um, have worked with Epic and um, they have um, identified roles that we're putting business rules around um, that really give them the granular Epic access that they need. Um, so that's, that's still kind of evolving as we get close to go live. There's lots of, you know, kind of shifting going on real quick, but um, um, so it starts with SAP data, but it really had to be enhanced. And that, that's where I, I think the business really kind of is finally kind of seeing like we don't really have good data and we need to, you know, even after Epic goes live, kind of invest in, um, you know, tracking truly um, the role that the people are doing, not just their job title and department that they're hired into, but what they're doing. Um, so we've we actually are using kind of a custom application to track that right now that um, the manager signs off. It goes to an Epic security person that'll review it. And it's kind of compared against their training really um, to make sure that they've, you know, 
they're the role they've selected they're getting the right training for um, before they're provisioned. Um, for students, they are a challenge. Um, they are in um, a module with an FAP and we do get information about them, but because we provision and deprovision around their semesters, um, that information right now is, um, or has been previously just delivered in spreadsheets each each mm -hmm. at the start of each semester. <laughs> you know, here's, here's 600 nursing students that are gonna be here next month. And um, just a kind of a real nightmare to manage, um, but we're working with IDG. Um, they they will be um, in our next phase of implementation with IDG and Epic. Um, they were kind of on the the back burner from our our employees um, because they'll be rotating out. We're, since we're going live in June, we'll we'll be rotating out a lot of the nurses. So. Um, but the residents and things like that are, are coming in hot and heavy in July. The July, June to July is our busy provisioning month at UK Healthcare for sure. That's when we, you know, get a, about 250 new residents, and we, um, um, those residents are then um, oftentimes onboarding as credentialed providers now. And um, so there's a lot, a lot going on <laughs> that month besides the Epic Go Live. So. Um, right. Yeah. That's, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Where are the qu the questions are now kind of snowballing. So let me, let me rush forward so we can address them for the audience. We have another question uh, from the audience. What other applications can you provision with this system? Is it capable of provisioning directory shared folders on shared common drives? So we aren't doing that, but I am going to say just from working uh, with the product that I would believe it would be able to. I think Wes may be. Yep. Yep. <laughs> You're right, that. Marilyn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one thing I, I will say about the tool um, with with Microsoft product, because really because of the, any tool really faces this, like I said, um, a lot of healthcare applications don't have APIs or, um, and you just have to use a GUI interface. And so previously we had bought um, basically just a, a, a kind of a, a tool to do some non-programming scripting that other people could use to basically do screen scraping. So um, with Microsoft, we actually had two tools. We had the Microsoft product and then um, this other product that would kind of walk through our screens and, and do the manual entry for us as we fed it data. Um, that was a big um, selling point with IDG that they have these bridges that will integrate with an application that doesn't have an API. So not only um, from my standpoint, because I support both systems and the servers that they live on and the upgrades that they have to go through. So to go from two products down to one that does, does it seamlessly um, is, is a huge win for me operationally. That's great, that's great. Uh, uh, Mike, did you want to add anything quickly? Because then we have like three more questions that I'd, I'd like to get, have us get to. No, go ahead, go to the next one. Okay, great. All right, we have another question from the audience. Are you tackling the creation of SERs with your ID solution into Epic and linking them to corresponding EMPs? Yeah, basically we're using the IDG tool to uh, basically create EMPs and SERs and link them. And the one thing that we really uh, like about this is we're actually able to uh, um, provision blueprints automatically. Uh, so that's one that was a big selling point for us. So we're actually implementing EMPs, SCRs, and blueprints. Yeah, that was yeah, it. And, and I think important. I think importantly, they're doing it via API. So you know, Epic's gone to a quarterly upgrade, and and some folks try and do this via scripting, and in one of those upgrades, inevit inevitably that scripting is going to break. Well, we're using the Epic API. Uh, that we we have a sandbox that we tested in before they release new new uh, new versions of Epic. So instead of scripting, you're using an API, which is a lot more stable and 
Mm-hmm. And that's that goes to the the really deep relationship that we have with Epic. And like I said, Marilyn and Mike, are, you know, it, it's just fortuitous that that y'all are, are standing up Epic. That that is one of our strongest relationships out there. And that was one of the things we knew we had to do uh, because we're not uh, back to the ROI question. We're not, we're we're not giving you that big ROI people savings, the soft ROI, uh, unless we can get you to the EMP and SER and blueprint level. Uh, in Epic, and and we're we're pretty proud of the of that uh, uh, private API that we built to to do that for y'all. Mm-hmm. Great, that makes sense. Thank you. And Wes, I have another uh, a question explicitly for you. Um, you mentioned Improvada positioning itself as a quote digital identity company. How yeah. do Improvada solutions work together? For example, if a healthcare organization is currently using one sign and then chooses to invest mm-hmm. in identity governance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, let's take that as an example. So with the release, uh, one sign is our flagship product, uh, about 75, 80% of the, the, the larger healthcare organizations out there have one sign. And one of the bigger, harder things that you can do when you stand up an identity governance uh, product uh, is uh, because you know you try and do it through demographic data and that kind of thing, but it, it's hard. So we thought about it and we went, wait, we've had these one sign customers that have been badging into applications for you know sometimes ten or twelve or fifteen years in a location. So we have have all, all this data, and, and what you can do, the the customer can do is is tell me uh, that's an ICU nurse, that's an ICU nurse, that's one, and that's one, and then I can go look at the one sign data. It does IDG does this automatically. I can go look at the one sign data and of these digital identities, show me the applications that they've used over the last six months. So instead of trying to guess what applications an ICU nurse needs to use, uh, Identity Governance, our Improvada IDG product, learns what applications an ICU nurse actually used via the one sign data and then can tell you Here's the applications that an ICU, the role ICU nurse should be, you should provision the, uh, him or her to. So, so that's a really good example of what's going on there. And then again, with Epic, because of that tight relationship, we actually have a report uh, that we can pull out and, and, and show that, yeah, you may have provisioned uh, Nurse Johnny with, you know, with these, the, to this EMP and SER level and blueprint in Epic. But you know, it's kind of an honor system when they go in there and check. You know, they click and say, "I'm doing this role." Well, if they're clicking and saying, "I'm doing this role," well, we can pull that report and say, "Yeah, they're doing the stuff that you said you provisioned them to." But also, look, they're also doing these things. So that gives people like Marilyn a chance to maybe adjust the role, or or slap a hand and say, "Hey, don't be doing that over there." Um, so, you know, those are just a couple of the out of the box integrations that come when you're, you're an Epic client and an IDG client. Um, so, uh, pr- pretty, pretty neat, uh, because we are that healthcare digital identity company and, you know, Gus has said very often, wherever there's a digital identity event in healthcare and Provada will be there. And we think we are, uh, by and large, especially with the, our acquisition of fair warning, uh, uh, last year, you know, now I can see what's happening with with that digital identity inside of the application, not just everything that's happening on the outside. So now we can give people like Marilyn and Mike this 360 degree view of what's happening with their digital identities throughout that life cycle while it's in their in their domain. Very good, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, one question for Marilyn and Mike, and then we'll have just enough time for me to ask each of you to leave our audience with one piece of advice or a prediction. So this question is, how do you deal with employees who have multiple roles, such as a different role in the AM versus the PM? You mean within Epic or just in general? Well, I'm not sure which what this audience oh. member meant. Oh, I, well, so I'm really able to, to, to add more to it. Basically, they can have multiple roles. They can division uh-huh. with the roles, but then when they log into Epic, they have to sign in to say which role they're working in. And so we that's how Epic handles multiple roles. Yeah. Is that is okay, that, good. 
I think so. I didn't ask, so I, I, that sounds that sounds right. So um, I think I think what they meant was someone who might work in one facility in the mor- in the morning and a different one in the evening. Same. Yeah, it'd be the same, same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, we have literally four minutes left. So what I'm going to ask uh, is for each one of mm-hmm. you, we'll just go in order in this order, Marilyn, Mike, and Wes, leave us with one minute each of a piece of advice for our audience to take away and or a prediction for what will happen in the next couple of years. Marilyn, do you want to go first? Oh, a piece of advice. I mean, I'm going to fo- focus on the operational side. So with with this epic, epic implementation, I think for us, um, you know, the, the tool itself, I mean, we have pivoted so much uh, with from the original design as things have come up. And um, like Mike had said, we were way ahead of, um, um, not way ahead, but but ahead of some of our Epic teams and, and thinking about how, how the security role, roles will be implemented. But um, for, for me, what, I, what it's always not thought about is the business process around it. Um, so when you're doing an implementation like that, I, the business processes are, seem to be like the the sticking point in a lot of this. Not necessarily the technical, the technical um, gotchas. In fact, I don't think we've run into anything that Improvada hasn't been able to do that we've asked you know asked it to do. So um, that's my advice. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. So when I took over the identity access management team back back last April, I guess. Um, you know, my vision of what they did was more of just, you know, answering tickets and granting access. But I guess over the year and bringing them in for information security, they're really sort of the front line of uh, your security plan. Uh, basically, they're, they're, they're a division of our cybersecurity where cybersecurity may have identity, um, um, uh, intrusion detection systems and intrusion protection systems and things like that to sort of help with the, um, you know, network traffic coming in and detecting, uh, you know, bad actors. Uh, our IAM team is really the front lines for our logical access into our systems, making sure that people have the right access and only the access they need. Uh, so we really need to start thinking about uh, IDGs and, and, and then access management in general as a security function, not just a access granting function. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And Wes? Uh, um, so some, a couple of predictions, much like happened uh, probably 10, 15 years ago on the clinical side of the house, where we had uh, multiple different uh, clinical applications that we had to, in HIT, we had to kind of stitch together with CCAO and HL7 to make behave uh, like an integrated uh, You've seen the, the, you know, the Epics and the Cerners and the Meditex and the Allscripts uh, integrate th- their suites to where uh, now uh, my, the Mikes and Marylands just stand up a clinical system uh, and not a whole bunch of d- different point solutions. I, I really think you're going to see that happen in identity management. Uh, there are, you know, every piece of identity, there is a point solution that you could purchase and, and you would have to knit together. Uh, it's it's really analogous to to where we were with the EHR 15 years ago. And I really think you're going to see, like Improvada is trying to do now, is these these suites of identity uh, and access management systems uh, so that, again, the people like Mike and Marilyn uh, aren't um, Home Depoting these point solutions. Instead, they're standing up an identity service uh, mm-hmm. that is, that is you know, well, epic. Uh, anything to do with identity is going to be owned by this provider. So that that's one. I think that'll take a little while. Uh, and another one that may may take just as long, but uh, I believe because, uh, like Jay said, uh, the CISA analyst, identity is everything. Uh, I think that identity positions uh, are going to be starting to be elevated within the organizations. I, I'm, I've seen uh, a couple of the larger organizations have actually vice presidents of identity and access management uh, that and and by that you can tell that 
they have figured out how how important identity is uh, in, in their organizations. And I think you're going to see that that trend uh, continue over the next, um, geez, starting now and over, over the next three or four years, uh, maybe five years from now, if we have this conversation, uh, there won't be uh, there won't be anybody that doesn't have a, a vice president of identity and access management. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Wes. Wes, Mike, Marilyn, thank you all for your incredible insights. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has. So thank you for participating in today's webinar. So we're going to close now. I want to thank the folks at Improvada for making today's program possible. And I want to thank everyone in our audience for joining us. We hope you'll join us in the future for another healthcare innovation webinar. Thank you for being with us today. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you.